Good afternoon, everyone. This is Alan Murabayashi speaking to you from New York, the world headquarters of Photo Shelter. You are listening to I Love Photography Live, episode 32. You might be watching us on youtube.com slash photoshelter, or you might be listening to the podcast that you found on iTunes by searching for I Love Photography. And remember, you can always tweet to us your questions or comments with hashtag I Love Photo. I'm joined today, as always, by my lovely co-host, Sarah Jacobs. Hey, Sarah, how are you doing? Hey, Alan, I'm doing good. Happy Friday. Happy Friday to you, and we have a special co-host today, photographer and author Brian Formals. Hey, Brian, how are you doing? Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Heard you have a new book coming out. Yes, I do. Uh, I co-authored a book called Photographer's Sketchbooks, um, published by Thames and Hudson, coming out in September in the UK, and then December in the United States. It's basically a look at uh, 48 photographers and their process for developing their projects, their their photo books, and their exhibitions. Um, and we're actually doing a talk at Photoville on the 26th uh, at 6 o'clock, and it runs till 7.30, so I hope to see some of you there. Well, we'll be out at Photoville, so hopefully we'll see you there too. I saw some big names in that sketchbook. There's some yeah. like powerhouse photographers. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we really kind of lucked out at getting some of the, the leading photographers that are working these days. Uh, Alex South, Roger Ballon, Vivian Sassan, uh, Peter Van Akmal. I mean, it was really a little bit intimidating, but also, uh, you know, as a photographer, I learned so much just talking to these guys and, and learning about their process. It was really, uh, it's an inspirational project. And I think that's what, you know, we're hoping people will get out of it that, you know, they'll be able to look at this book and, and really kind of learn a little bit more about the process of building their projects and creating their books. Sarah, we'll let, we're going to put the link up to, uh, to Amazon.com for pre-orders for that book. I think that's a, that's a good one. That link and all the links that we talk about today will be on our blog at blog.photoshelter.com. And with that, why don't we talk about our first story. Since yesterday was September 11th, you know, Sarah, we were talking yesterday and we said, ah, we don't need to do anything on September 11th. And Brian had actually found a story that I declined on, and then I read the story, then I was like, oh, this is actually a good story. <laughs> we should talk about this. And it's about an ele electrician who came from Estonia and worked the graveyard shift at Windows on the World, at the top of the, the trade centers. And he also, this was, I mean, this was late 90s, obviously early 2000s, and he was also a prolific photographers. So the New Yorker had a really nice piece on this guy, Konstantin Petrov. Um, and he would, you know, go into these places when nobody was there and take these photos. Uh, really just kind of beautiful observational photos. And uh, the, 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 the article references the fact that he put all of this stuff on Fotkey. And Fotkey was like the primitive flicker built by Eastern Europeans because they wanted to put their <laughs> photos on to Flickr, and I found his photo key site. I have never heard of this photo key. Oh. Brian, did you have a photo key? No, I never heard of it. This first, this is, that was actually the first I heard of it was in that story, and I was like, oh, wow. I mean, I thought it was interesting that they actually came here and tried to get funding, you know, pre-Flickr, and yeah. then turned down, you know. Yeah, people were like, oh, why would anyone ever want to put photos on the internet? Oh, my God. <laughs> you know, it's funny, it's funny what, a, what, what 13, 15 years can, can make. But, but a really interesting article, and the crazy thing was they, the, there was a filmmaker who wanted to do a documentary uh, on 9-11, and he, and he found these photos, and he tried to track down Constantine, and it turns out there was no more Constantine. No. Uh, yeah, and the article, I mean, yeah, it goes on to say that he was an avid motorcycle rider, which was seen in a lot of these photo key photos. He's got whole albums of uh, motorcycle photos, and he died in a motorcycle accident like a year later or something like that? Yeah. Yeah, I think it was like a year later, yeah, 2002 maybe. Um, but just a wacky, really interesting story, and, you know, the photos, like this photo is, is quite lovely. He has some, yeah. I mean, not everything unilaterally is great, but, but you know, a photo like this at sunset with the chairs where the colors match, it's just really, really nice. 
Yeah, yeah that, that's my favorite one there. That's just kind of, that has that haunting feel to it, you know, of the sunset and just a very kind of eerie feeling to it, you know. I, I would love to see more. Like, I, I kind of want to dig in. I'll have to dig in and look at all all the stuff that he did because, you know, normally when you find those big treasure troves, it's like you have all this mess of photos and it takes a little bit of sifting to find the gems, you know. Yeah, he was really good about his, his organizational skills there. Sarah, what did you think about his photos? Uh, I like it. I mean, they're really... They're odd. <laughs> they're very kind of like they're very artful, <laughs> but they're very artful and and just I would have never known what the inside of the World Trade Center looked like. So I'm I'm happy that he took them and happy to see this sort of strange depiction of it. So that's kind of interesting that they said there weren't that many photos of the inside that yeah. they struggled to find them. You know, when I on September 11th, when when I I was down there and I ran out onto the street and. I was on the east side of the buildings and a lot of the press was on the west side because the west side highway was there. And I ended up getting a lot of photos of the east side um, which I submitted to the National Institutes of Standard and Technology when they were doing their whole study of why the buildings collapsed because there were no photos from the east side. So it's interesting to see like he was on the inside. Nobody had photos on the inside because why would you take photos of the inside of the building? Take photos all the time, people. Yeah, just yes. do it. <laughs> yeah, lesson of the story. Speaking of treasure troves, another great story of another great photographer over on the New York Times, uh, a legal battle over Vivian Mayer's work. And if you don't know Vivian's work, she was a French immigrant working as a nanny who carried around a, a Rolleiflex. It's a TLR. It's a square frame, a 6 by 6 Um and did street photography in New York while she was a nanny and it's incredible incredible photography it was only found after her death in 2008 and people were like holy crap where did this person come from um, but she came from France she had you know and and all these negatives ended up in all these different places and people would buy boxes of her negatives for you know forty dollars or whatever um, and people found them and then she became very famous and now there's a legal battle over who uh, is the rightful heir to the estate because people are selling these photos and there's really no <laughs> clear there's like a, a first cousin once removed which is that's not even related at that point let's be honest come on come on so I don't know what to say about who should be the rightful owner but Brian you said you found her stuff on Flickr when all of this stuff was kind of emerging the legal battles were emerging yeah, I know. I mean, it was. I've been following this literally since the beginning. John Maloof, who has the the largest uh, set of negatives and who made the film, you know, Finding Vivian Meyer, he originally posted them on the Flickr forum, Hardcore Street Photography, which I was very active on for many years. And he literally went on and said, you know, I have all these great photos. What do I do with them? <laughs> you know. And we all jumped on it kind of like right away. It's like this stuff is like brilliant you know you got to try to like reach out to uh, you know galleries curators maybe you know book publishers or what have you so yeah I've been following this like nearly since the beginning I've, I've met uh, John Maloof and I've talked to him uh, occasionally online and you know my opinion is that he's working in good faith like he's really interested in doing what's right and you know but has the story has evolved and ballooned obviously with all the attention and now the money you know I'm always just kind of like, once that happens, you know the lawyers are going to get involved. and uh, you know. So this doesn't surprise me that this is happening. But obviously, you know, it's important to get to the bottom of it as well. Sarah, these photos are as good as any street photos from New York City that I've seen in the history of photography. I mean, you look at, you look at this kid on the horse. You look at this, uh, this guy being arrested. The, the composition of these are, are stunning. Yeah, I mean, you look through her entire archive that I guess Maloof has helped, you know, put together um, online, and she, Vivian, just nails it every time. She just nailed the shot every time. She has so many great photographs and um, and portrait work from the streets. It's and self portrait work as well. I mean, this woman must have just been shooting all the time, constantly. You know, there's that one photo of Kirk Douglas at. Uh, a movie premiere um, mm -hmm. and it looks like she's literally on the red carpet I assume this is before I mean the red carpet existed but before the paparazzi was there in droves and, and whatnot 
and I was trying to imagine to myself what the context was. Was she with a stroller, like taking the kids out, and she's like, oh, look, there's a movie premiere, or did she wander the streets after she worked? I, mean, I don't know how nannies worked back in the day. Was she like a full-time nanny or whatnot? I mean, it's so interesting to see the breadth and, and depth of photography. Did, did you get any insight to that when you were talking to Maloof at all, Brian? Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, there's been so many articles and stories that have come out on it that, like, and the big thing is everyone's trying to determine her intent because she never showed the photos to anyone. So there's a lot of people arguing that, hey, she might not have wanted the publicity. She might not wanted to have all of this out there, and perhaps, you know, it's disrespectful for everyone to now jump on it, you know, because the artistic intent, the photographer's intent, is, is so important you know, in how he, the photographs are presented. So I've seen a lot of arguments about that of like, you know, maybe she didn't even want them to be out there. And that really creates an interesting dilemma, I think. But personally, I'm glad they are out there, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I think one could, could argue effectively that now that there's no real direct air and the photos are so incredible. It's sort of like if you found Beethoven music and you didn't share it with anyone, you yeah, real it really, it really right. is like that. It really <laughs> is. It, it's nice to have a, a lady's name too up there with Will yeah. and all that. So yeah. I, I also want to point out, Sarah, that you know I use the Americanization mayor. I was like Vivian Mayer, and and Brian corrected me very quickly. <laughs> that, that's yeah, cool. Oops. I like that. I like that. <laughs> uh, over on feature shoots. A little uh, portrait series of a woman who went out on a bunch of Tinder dates. If you don't know what Tinder is, you're probably not in your 20s. Tinder is a mobile app that allows you to swipe uh, right to accept someone and left to reject them. Or do I have that reversed? I can never remember. Maybe that's why I'm not getting any dates. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Left uh, to accept, yep. But if you've heard of Match.com or eHarmony, you know, those are the types of things you would use if you're 30, 40, 50, or above. OkCupid okay, was a 20s thing maybe five years ago, and now there's Tinder. So this woman went out on a bunch of dates, and then she took uh, photos of these guys. I guess they consented to have their photos taken. The Aussie photographer is Kira Cheers. Now, I'll be honest, guys. There have been a lot of uh, social media experiments, if you will, on going out on 100 Tinder dates or taking photos of people that you meet online. Crowdsourcing your dating life. What did you guys think of uh, this particular set of photos, Brian? Well, I, I agree with you. I was like, oh, come on. Like, this is, like, you know, the basic idea of, you know, kind of exposing the randomness of, of this, of Tinder and dating and what have you. Um... But I kind of want to give her the benefit of the doubt here because I think she pulled it off. And, I, and I, you know, the photos, on stuff like this, I always go to the photos. And I think, like, the portraits, you know, there's a little bit of that awkwardness or that tension in them that I sense. So to me, like, that I kind of, like, saves it. But in terms of, like, conceptually, you know, oriented projects, it, it seems a little uh, simplistic for my taste at times. But... Sarah, have you have you used Tinder before? And if so, where's your portrait series? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Talk about a captive audience that she had right there. I mean, first of all, this is photographic proof that good-looking men actually are on Tinder and yes. that they just don't know how to pick good photos for their profiles. <laughs> so that's, ah. that's good to know. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I... I liked the series a little bit more after I read her personal um, explanation of it on her site. She also has an audio piece to it um, of her on the date, and it's her interaction with the guy. And so I was listening to that while looking through the photos, and it kind of adds this other layer to the series that I really liked. Um, you can really tell, you know, which guys she kind of connected to, which ones she didn't. I think the image that I'm most drawn to is the man laying down in the grass, and yes. um, mm -hmm. I think it's the I think it's the strongest image of the series. But actually, it also gives off this sort of um, illusion that she probably didn't connect with this person a lot. There seems to be this disconnection, and it might just be that he's not looking at the camera. But there's just this kind of air about it where it's like mm, it didn't work out with this one with Chris. Not not to stereotype <laughs> him, but the occupation occupation is actor model and there's a bit of 
there's a bit of ego in this. Yes, <laughs> no. yes, you're right. There's a little bit of ego. There's a little bit of disconnect. Yeah. Now, I think that the more interesting project would have been uh, a diptych of the text messages next to the image because mm -hmm. some of the text uh, interactions, for example, we'll show you this one here, are just they're so over the top. You know, Tinder is known as a hookup app, so we really shouldn't be surprised. But you know, the audacity that people have. Uh, you know, just to ask for sex and being like, "Hey, you, you know, it's it'll be great. It'll be a good exchange for us." <laughs> um, oh yeah, there's like there's numerous tumblers out there where people post the horrifying messages they receive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, you know, one of the reasons I stay away. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> I don't want to on Tumblr saying something stupid. <laughs> Uh, the downfall of all the recording devices that we have nowadays. You don't want to write anything, and now you don't want to you don't want to be videotaped doing anything because you'll get into trouble for that. Oh yeah. <laughs> Fuji trolls DSLR users. You know, Brian, you found this one on Petapixel. It's a it's an illustration uh, of the of the very iconic uh, evolution of man from the the chimp on his feet, um, kind of hunched over into the walking man, and they're using it as a way to make poke fun at uh, DSLR owners who are known for lugging pounds and pounds of equipment um, and, and really killing their back. And the solution that Fuji has posed is much lighter, mirrorless cameras. And I will say, 10 years ago, I would have been like, this is a dumb ad. But now, getting older and every pound counts of what you're carrying around, I, I totally agree with this. I totally agree. And Brian? No offense, you don't look like a spring chicken either. Maybe <laughs> yeah. this really resonated with you. Oh yeah, you know I, I'm a Fuji fanboy. I have the X10, um, which is the smallest version of it. But yeah, I, if you're like the documentary or photographer, you're like, you know, shooting lifestyle kind of stuff on the fly. It's like, you know, it really makes sense. But you know, Leicas have been around forever as well too. It's not like rangefinders is is something like fundamentally new, but. Uh, you know, I, I, I really applaud Fuji because I think, like, somehow they have captured the imagination a little bit of uh, photographers with just the style that they, you know, they've brought to the cameras and, you know, the functionality, and they just keep getting better. So it's like I was a little skeptical at first, but Fuji is really, like, they're, they're on top of it, you know. Um, you know, so I, I, I like carrying my X10 around, but I, I'm also an old-school medium format photographer too, so I, I have a, a hefty backpack I end up carrying around more often than not. Sarah, you are a diehard Canon shooter. N never been tempted to move to mirrorless, something lighter? No, I don't think so, no. But you, you love your Sony, right? I love my Sony. I mean, I love my Sony when I don't need to motor. Mm -hmm. I don't need to shoot more than one frame per second. I love my Sony when I don't need to zoom because it's a fixed 35 millimeter. But, you know, that's that's like 90% of the time. Right. I will say I just ordered today my iPhone 6. Guys, oh. don't hate. Don't hate, guys. Okay. <laughs> um, so I ordered, and there was a big debate. I, I talked to Brad Manchin, who's shot a lot. You know, he has a book about his Instagram photography. And he was actually invited to the Apple unveiling, and I said, which phone are you going to get? Six or six plus? He goes, six plus. Because he shoots all the time on it. Totally makes sense. And he, and he always wears like cargo pants, so he has huge pockets. Mm. Me, you know, we live in New York. We got to wear skinny jeans. How am I going to put a six plus <laughs> in my skinny jeans? It's not yeah. going to happen. No, it's not going to happen. Not going to work. There were practical considerations that I had in regards to that. But, you know, these, uh, it, it's incredible how good the, the camera sensors are getting. Um, I think because I'm too much, uh, I, I'm too nutty about image quality that I'm always going to have a dedicated camera. But you know, when you're at a restaurant and you want to Instagram your food, these cameras are <laughs> these cameras are good enough. <laughs> Let's just be honest about that. <laughs> um, this was an interesting piece. Speaking of Instagram, uh, over on Huffington Post, uh, it's an article about. The, the way that, that photography is conceived of uh, and the nostalgia that it induces. It's an uh, article written um, by a guy uh, named Jason Silva. 
And he says, quote, we're experiencing the present as an anticipated memory. Because we spend so much time thinking about the photo before we take it, and not only not only thinking about it in terms of, okay, how am I going to frame it, but thinking about it in terms of, well, is it going to get a lot of likes? And, and because it's going to be in a stream somewhere, whether it's on Facebook or Instagram, we think about it contextually in the history of our curated stream, like how we want it to, to represent us over time. And it's interesting because Jason says it's not a bad thing. I, I think a lot of people would counter and say that's actually a bad thing because you're not living in the moment or you're spending so much time thinking about the curation. But with so much data, one could argue that the curation is actually an important part about photography nowadays. I don't know. What'd you think? What'd you think, Brian? Yeah. I, I, so I've been. I follow Jason Silva, and he's he's pretty. You know, he would. I would call him like a techno utopian kind of guy. He really believes in like we're gonna emerge into this transhuman, half human, half machine. <laughs> so he's really on the optimistic end of that stuff. And I think like in terms of you know, the way we are constructing our narratives and, like, how we want our lives to be remembered and, like, through not only the photographs but everything we tweet or put on Facebook, I think, like, I think we're just coming to terms with what that actually means, that we're going to be able to, like, like, create this narrative over our lives and be remembered in a certain way. Whereas I don't necessarily think when people were taking snapshots, you know, prior to the internet that, you know, they probably just thought they were going to stay in that photo albums and under their beds or what have you. They never kind of imagined that it could be something that could reach out to millions of people or thousands of people. Um, in terms of, like, living in the moment, I mean, uh, I actually think you sometimes become more present when you're photographing, and it becomes a little of a, a hyper-perceptual you know, situation where you're really more focused, and it's you know, it's one fraction of a second. So I don't, I don't necessarily buy into that that you're not living in the moment. Um, but you know, it's something to think about. Like I'm always thinking about the way we're constructing our narratives, especially like through photography and through our blogs and through Twitter and all that. And it's just, it's kind of like endlessly fascinating to me. Um, I don't really have a clear, you know, answer or kind of idea of the way I think it's going to play out, but. Um, my hunch is that we're just kind of like coming to terms with it, you know. Sarah, we used to have to wait till our end of end of our lives for for a biographer to come along and compile all of this information and put it into a narrative form. And now it's almost like we're writing our bios as we go along. And the same is true with with sort of the photos. We're we're kind of curating as we go along, good or bad, from your from your take. I mean, I, I think it's good, but I think it's something that uh, artists and specifically photographers have always felt, and now it's just kind of spreading to the mass public, and they're like, oh, right, we want to, like, remember things a certain way and frame things a certain way. But I think it's in the artist's nature, you know, to craft something the way that they want to see it and the way that, whether that's a physical form or a memory, so... I, you know, somebody should have already done it, but taken, obviously it's a copyright violation, but done Vivian Meyer's work as an Instagram. Because it's already <laughs> in the square format. Yeah. It's toned beautifully. Yeah. And I just, I can't imagine what her Instagram stream would have been like. Like, that would have been amazing. Well, it would have been exactly like her archive, I think. Yeah, but, but just, you gotta yeah. think, there's gotta be a nanny in New York today who's, like, secretly an amazing photographer. And I want to follow that person on Instagram. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're getting a little deep talking about the philosophy of, of cameras and, and photography. So why don't we stay on the topic for just one second. Sarah, I know you didn't want to talk about the Kate Upton nudes, but this is, that's only a, a part of this particular article. Uh, I found this over on Time, uh, time.com. And the interesting thing that uh, the opening line of this article by the uh, 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 author James Poniewozik. I'm, I'm probably butchered that uh, Polish name. He says, we live in the age of the image as weapon. Uh, and part of his point is uh, uh, images have always been used as propaganda, but now they're used as weapons. Um, uh, porn shaming, um, execution photos. Uh, and it was really interesting to see how how 
for example, ISIS is co-opting photography and using it to their advantage and using photography in conjunction with social media to amass an army of the latest figure I read was 31,000 fighters, which is larger than the armies of many nations and is almost as large as the NYPD. Like that's a ginormous force of people that have gotten together um, and, and arguably more successful than Al-Qaeda. Um, so to see the, the image as a weapon, uh, interesting times. I don't know if you guys have anything to add to that other than kind of shake your head and be like, wow. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't look at them. Uh, I don't, I mean, there's, if you're on Twitter and you follow a lot of the journalists, I mean, it's pretty, the sentiment is pretty strong, like, do not, yeah. do not don't look at these, you know. So now I don't, you know, to me, I don't need to see it. I don't, you know, I it's not something, you know, I have an active enough imagination. I don't need to actually see the image. But, you know, once it's out there, what are you going to do? I mean, it's almost unstoppable, the, you know. And and that's really the power of it, right? It's like there's no filter. They can just put it out there, and then it's there. You know, there's it's unstoppable. And I think that's, again, it's like what what do you do? How? Let me ask you guys a question. This This week, the Ray Rice video of him punching his then fiance in the face in an elevator came out. We already knew that it had happened. Or we knew to you know a 95% certainty that it happened. He said it happened, but this week the video came out. Um, it's not a photo per se, but but it is a visual recording of, of what had happened. Sarah, did that was that something that you, you think should have been watched by a lot of people? A lot of domestic violence uh, people in the field were saying this is actually one you should watch so you understand the severity of the action. Um, I actually have not been following that story. Okay. <laughs> I have not. <laughs> Let's go to Brian. What do you think about that? Is that something you would watch? Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I think it, what's interesting with that is really the indictment that it, it serves to the NFL because like, they've kind of like tried, thought they could like just brush it under the rug and that it would go away. And now it's coming out that they've had the video and someone saw the video for three months and they literally were trying to cover it up, you know. So, uh, you know, there's that element too. But in terms of, like, um, trying to understand the truth, I think, like, I'm a little disturbed that that we need the video to, to believe the victims, you know. Yeah. Like, that, yeah. that's kind of the problem I, I have with it. It's like we needed that, you know. You know, and, and I think that's that, that becomes problematic, you know, in terms of watching it and believing it. Um, yeah, you know, it, it just illuminates so many, so many different problems, and I like, I can't believe that there's, you know, people out there that would, uh, you know, somehow try to br brush that under the rug as it's no big deal, you know, because once you see it, it's just horrifying, you know. I, I think it it certainly has sort of galvanized public sentiment against the NFL's policies and Roger Goodell and the 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 lightness with which they, they take domestic violence. It's interesting to see, like, you know, when, when you say, why did we need the video? It's kind of like when someone gets kidnapped and you need the proof of life photo of them holding the daily newspaper to be like, I'm still alive. So even, even in this time of photo manipulation and Photoshop and whatnot, the photo still has power as proof, which I think is, is good in, in, in a lot of ways. The, the good outweighs the bad in that case. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of hand-wringing about photography doesn't have that documentary power anymore. And, like, you, something like this, it's like, did anyone question it? You didn't say, oh, that's Photoshopped or that was manipulated. Like, we believed it, you know? But there's other instances where we see photos and it's like, oh, I bet that's Photoshopped. Or, like, we don't really trust them, you know? So this is, like, a good example where it's like, you know, we trust the video. We trust that it's real, you know? So I still think it absolutely has, photography has that power to, like, be evidence and be proof, you know. Let's look at some photos since we've been talking about photography so much. This was super interesting. Uh, over on Petapixel, uh, an article about the first wildlife photographs published in National Geographic. Now, in today's age, and if you grew up anywhere from, you know, probably the 50s onward, you really think of uh, National Geographic as a photographic magazine rather than a bunch of guys that got together and said, we're going to talk about our travels around the world. <laughs> but these were the first photos of wildlife 
uh, from 1906. And they were so controversial that two of the board members resigned in disgust because they argued that uh, the magazine was turning, quote, into a picture book. Really fascinating, first of all, to see how the, the length that these guys went to to get the photo. I mean, not dissimilar. Like, if you think about the technology in 1906, the amount of effort they're putting into getting these photos is not dissimilar to the National Geographic guys now. So that, at least, they have in common. But to think of National Geographic as not having iconic photography is also very strange. Mm. Now, these photos are not great because they're <laughs> night photography. <laughs> right. What was probably, you know, ISO 50 film <laughs> at the time. Oh, my God, yeah. Um, but from a historical perspective, just pretty amazing, right, Sarah? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's so great to see how far we've come. I mean, this is not the animals in their natural state at all. They're freaking out because they're <laughs> reacting to the flash and they're, like, running away. You know, and now we have GoPros that are able to, like, fly over them with drones. Oh, and... we could put the GoPro on the animal. On the right. Oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. And just see the world from their perspective. So it's, it's fun to see how far that wildlife photography has really come. I, I, can't, even, I can't even comprehend how much more sensitive to light our sensors have become in the past five years. Remember when, you know, when I got my first Nikon D1X, it was 1600 and you didn't really want to push it even that far because it was so grainy. And now we have ISO 400 7000. Um, and last night on Instagram, since it was September 11th, I saw Vince LaFerre up in a helicopter shooting Towers of Light. And again, he was probably at ISO, you know, 6400, 128. 25, 6, something like that. Um, just just nutty. Brian, what do you think? Like, I kind of yeah, like I, these, these lands. I, I agree with you about the ISM being able to shoot at night. I think, like, that's really, like, a new frontier because now you can, sh you know, you sh pitch black, you're shooting at F11. You know, the depth of field you can get now is, like, insane. And, like, that actually fundamentally changes kind of what you can do, especially if you're shooting handheld at night. So I think, like, that is... You know, and the sky's the limit, it seems like, in terms of, you know, what they can do. And, like, yeah, it's just, it's, it's opening up the game, you know, so fast that I can't even keep up with it. You know, it's like uh, tr trying to understand how to use those in a creative context is, um, you know, it's a frontier. It's definitely a frontier. I was shooting from my roof uh, towards the, the Towers of Light last night. And I don't know what I was thinking. I was like, you know what? I don't want to go over ISO 3200. So I was hand-holding at a 40th of a second, and I came back down, and I looked at all the photos, and they're all blurry. And I'm thinking to myself, why would you do that? Just go to 6400 and shoot at an 80th. Like, what's the big deal? Never left. Yeah. Still stuck oh, in that ways. I think, it, yeah, it's a legacy hang-up. It's like, almost like you don't believe it, you yeah. know? And yeah, I think that's because I shoot even on my Olympus. I can go up to 1600. And I'm still like, I don't know, I don't know, and like it's ridiculous because I look at them and there's nothing. They look fine. So I think there's definitely. But I wonder if like a younger generation just isn't going to have that hangout. It's just it's going to be commonplace and they won't even think about it. You know, they'll think like, why would you ever shoot at f100 or f200? Like that's right. the thing. What's the point? You know? Yeah. Uh, so we saw some photos that were kind of taken in the dark, and they were a little bit blurry. And then here are some photos that were, are, are a little sharper, I would say. Uh, the photographer is London-based uh, Tim Flack, Flack, uh, F-L-A-C-H, and he took some animals into a studio. Here is a tiger uh, shaking water off of his head with a black seamless behind him. Um, and uh, kind of backlit so that the sprinkles of water show up, as well as his spit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the trails of drool. <laughs> the trails of drool. But uh, the, the photos that he has, there's one of a chicken, uh, a hairless chicken that was bred that way, uh, I guess for eating. But these photos were really, really great. How did you respond to these? We've seen a lot of uh, animal photos, Sarah. I know. Well, these are technically very incredibly well done. And also, they just show the character, uh, the animal's personality so much. I love that about them. I mean, he must just have a, a way with animals to take these because 
you just see their personalities shine through, and I love that. These are great. This one is, I mean, it looks like a person. It's bizarre. I, I'm still trying to figure out what's happening in this photo. <laughs> it's, yeah, all the ones of the primates really kind of like, like that one, yeah, those are the ones that kind of freak me out because it's, you know, they are us, you know? Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. an ad. That's an ad. Put put some sort of phone in his, just Photoshop yeah. a phone in his <laughs> hand, and that's an ad. Exactly. Oh, yeah. It's incredible. You know, the lighting is so spectacular. It really is. It really brings them to life and shows every single detail on their skin or fur, in their eye, in their nose. I mean, it's amazing. I don't know if you guys saw Planet of the Apes, but, you know, all of those things were CGI. And this, I mean, if you told me this was, like, from the trailer for Planet of the Apes, I would have believed you. It's just so, <laughs> it's so cinematic in its quality. I know it's silly to say that, that a photo is cinematic because... But it is. Yeah. yeah. But it is. Yeah. It's very hyper real, yeah, with how close he's up. Um, in the files of irony, uh, Getty Images has sued Microsoft because over on Bing Images, they have allowed the images to be embeddable. And Getty, as you might recall, uh, started allowing several million of their photos to be embeddable for non-commercial purposes and it's been a huge success for them. Huge success and they're now in the big data collection. Um, and I guess Bing decided that they would do the same and then Getty said, you can't do this, we own the copyrights or we control some of the copyrights and they cited incalculable damages. This is this is just crazy. I mean, I, I totally, I totally understand Getty's point of view because they're infringing on photographers' rights. But it's a little ironic that they're they're now like being pro photographer after they kind of screwed over a lot of photographers with their their embeddable technology. Sarah. <laughs> well, I actually have a question about this. I don't sure. quite understand why Getty gets to sue Microsoft. I mean, are the Getty images showing up and being embeddable on this? How does that work? Yeah, I mean, I think. I think if you got Getty into a room and you said, "Hey, well, you know, we're not going to monetize these images. Let's let's make them embeddable." Just generically speaking, I think Getty would say, "Yeah, that's a great idea because that's exactly what they did." <laughs> right, right. But when you embed it with Bing technology, Getty doesn't get the benefit of knowing where it is. Of where it is. Yes, right. And, so and Getty images are showing up in Bing search results. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and and they want them to because that's how discovery happens on the internet. Like nobody Nobody's going to go to, like, Getty Images to search. People will intuitively go to Google Images first. Right. That's just the way the world works now. Especially people who don't want to pay for images. Especially those people. <laughs> right. Yeah. My question is, does anyone use Bing? Yeah, that's a very valid question, Brian. I think Bing has something like 4% of search traffic worldwide or something like that. So the answer, Brian, is no. <laughs> so, you know, the notion of, of incalculable damages is really like incalculable um, times 0 .04, <laughs> which is a lot less, I think. I'm not sure if that's infinity times 0 .04 or something less than infinity. Anyway, we'll follow this. It's just, it's just a funny turn of events for those guys. Um, I guess this is all about animals today. Yeah, There's animals. another set. Of animal photos. British Wildlife Photography Awards. The 2014 winners uh, are announced, and here uh, is The Tourist by Lee Acaster um, of a gray, gray lag goose in London. Uh, and a quite lovely photo. He used a little strobe. He, he took down the ambient light. It looks like he boosted the saturation or the, uh, the vibrancy in some of the colors there because the orange beak and the kind of rust color uh, feet come out really, really nicely, but uh, compared to some of the f the past year's winners, which are more uh, wild lifey, at least in the environment, this was kind of an unexpected surprise to have wildlife in an urban environment and take a really nice photo. How did you feel about it being artificially lit, Brian? Um... I'm like whatever, man. Like, I, I <laughs> photographers, why? I thought, you know, I'm I'm pretty open. I don't have any constraints. Kind of like, as long as they get the image and, and it's something interesting, I don't I don't really have a problem with it. I mean, my, what I find interesting is like in terms of the wildlife. It's like, and this is kind of grim, but like, 
you know, how many of these animals are going to be extinct in 50 years? You know? Yeah. We're in the middle of this huge mass extinction event, they say. So it's like, I think like we, I, generally I never really was, a, you know, would look at much wildlife photography, but I'm like, I'm glad there are so many people out there doing this, you know? Like, yeah. I'm glad it's an obsession for so many people because like, we just don't know, you know? It's, 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 it's a scary time for like what's happening to you know, the natural environment, especially wildlife, so... Uh, it's I'm kind of like uh, Constantine taking photos of the inside of the trade centers, and you're like, yeah. oh, now they're not there anymore, now you have the photos, yeah. and here, here, here's the wildlife, Sarah. What do you think of, uh, of the winners this year? I've only seen the tourists. That's the only one I looked at. That's a nice photo. But it is a nice photo. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Cool, I'm down with that. I like that photo. What do you think of them using strobes? That's sort of, I mean, that's not normal. It's a little it, weird. It, it's a little weird, but, you know, when we go back to that first published photo, National Geographic, oh, yeah, mm -hmm. it was strobed. They yeah. used a strobe to take the photo. <laughs> there you go. I mean, He's going back to his roots. The, 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 their strobe was on the axis of the camera, so it's a little more literally deer in the headlights. Uh, <laughs> this guy is, you know, 45 degrees, if not more, off the axis. I think he did a little more artfully, but... You know, the, it was a little bit easier for him to do than going in a boat and carrying flash powder and all that, that good stuff that they used to have to do. Um, a lost and found photo, we, we talked about Vivian's trove of photos that were found, and Sarah, you know, it's like every third show we talk about another trove of photos that have been found. And here was a huge... Uh, trove of photos found by a photographer named Jeff Phillips. Jeff didn't take the photos, he just found these. And there were, there were boxes and boxes of uh, slides, 1,000 Kodachrome slides that he found of this couple, Harry and Edna. And he went onto social media and he said, does anybody know who these people are? Because he wanted to sort of reconstruct this. So here's a, here's a photo from Facebook, is this your mother? <laughs> um, and it took him three weeks to find out who these people were. Amazing. It's just, just incredible. You know, it's like those people that, uh, we don't really know if it's true, but they said, oh, I found a roll of film in Central Park, and I wanted to find out who shot <laughs> it. And it turned out it was this couple, like a really attractive couple from Eastern Europe, and you know, all this kind of <laughs> stuff that goes on. But, but I just, maybe I need to go to more yard sales, since I love this stuff so much. Mm -hmm. These are really nice photos. I know, you need oh, to yeah. find your own trove, Alan. Yeah, it's huge. I mean, there's 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 photographers that are like obsessed with that. Like, I got obsessed with it a couple years ago. I would just like dig through Flickr and try to find whatever. And it's kind of amazing what you can find. But at, sometimes, like, you look at so much vernacular photography, and it's just kind of you get a little like immune to it. You know, it's like, oh, here's another family photo, another vacation photo. So again, it's really like, how do you go and find the gems? You know. And what kind of really sticks out as a story? You know, I think this is a charming story, but in terms of like, from what I've seen of vernacular photos, I've seen stuff that's kind of like a little bit more out there and a little bit more interesting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, again, I like the social media angle too. That like, again, how we were constructing. You know, it's almost like an investigation of like who these people were. And, you know, where are their relatives? So I think that that angle is kind of interesting. And obviously, we'll keep seeing that happening. Brian's dropping a lot of terminology on us today, Sarah, with the vernacular photo. I like that. <laughs> I like that. It's good. No, I, you know, I, I agree with you. Uh, the one thing I, I would say, I think historically, just because less photos were taken back in the day, they're, they're always interesting to me from a historical perspective to say, well, who was actually spending disposable income on photography at the time? To take a thousand Kodachrome slides. Oh, yeah. You know, I think back in the day it would be like you'd take one roll of film a year. Um, so it's just interesting to see these people back in the day really, really invest in photography for yeah, whatever I'm reason. I'm totally blanking, but I had in one of the magazine I did a magazine LPV, and like um, in one of the issues we did, uh, there was this very wealthy guy who just was an obsessive photographer. He went all over the world, and uh, it's, it's called the Nick DeWolf Ar Archive. Nick DeWolf. And, like, yeah, he was all over the world shooting Kodachrome. It just has this massive archive, and it's all on Flickr. Like, uh, whoever is responsible for it now has, like, uploaded basically every single frame. 
So it's like you can see him like working the scene where he's got like ten different versions um, of the scene. But yeah, it's like uh, th there's there's got to be still some of those amazing archives out there. So I don't. I, I'm glad again people are out there searching for it. You know. Yeah. Very cool stuff. We always like to end on a happy note or at least a funny note, and this definitely uh, would would fit the bill for both of those. <laughs> on the website, sad and useless, somebody has compiled a set of photos of dads at One Direction concerts. For those of you uh, who aren't teenagers, you might not know the British boy band One Direction. <laughs> Um, but if you're young at heart like me, then you listen to One Direction all the time. I'm just kidding. I don't do that. Uh, but here's a very funny set of dads who had to take their young daughters to the show. And it's just hilarious. Here's the first guy with earplugs in, and it looks like he might be doing some sort of meditation. <laughs> now, here, here is a situation, guys, where photography could lie. Because obviously, in the context of a two-hour show, everybody's going to have a moment where they look bored. And we don't know whether the show is actually on or they're waiting for the show to come on. Here's a guy, another guy with earplugs uh, texting on his phone. Um, but from a humor perspective, these are just very, very funny. Yeah. Sarah, Sarah, I know you like these. Oh, I love these. I, I found these a while ago. I feel like, I feel like uh, some really great photographer needs to take on this idea still um, and keep going with it. Or the guy who, sh who shot all the black and whites. He needs to keep going. It's a great angle. <laughs> I mean, clearly from a sociological perspective, right. I think it's so interesting, you know, dads that are, like, supporting their daughters going to this show, um, but just being like, oh, my God, this guy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my question is, how do we know they're dads? Maybe they're fans of One Direction. We don't know. We don't know. Yeah, that's, uh, a, very, that's a good point. Good point. Another lie that could be yeah, exactly. in the photo. <laughs> I, I think this guy's probably a dad. <laughs> I don't think he's going to the show. <laughs> oh, God, these make me laugh. These are, yeah. just, these are very funny. Love them. Oh, well, that was a good note to end on. All of the links that we looked at today uh, will be on the blog at blog.photoshelter.com. But, hey, Brian, it was great to have you. I hope you join us again. Yeah, absolutely. It's fun. Sarah, good to see you. It's always going to be another nice weekend. Maybe take the camera out. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. So for Brian and Sarah, this is Alan Murabayashi signing off for another episode of I Love Photography. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.